This particular game is one that I'm very glad I got the chance to review. Some of you might remember that back in October 2021, I reviewed another Chinese-based RPG called Xuan Yuan Sword 7. That video did surprisingly well on the channel, and I thought the game itself was pretty solid. As its name suggests, it was the seventh game in that series, but it was the first time one of them had been localized for the West. And that brings us to the game we're talking about today, which was created by the same developers and is also the seventh game in its own series. In China, this game is known as Chinese Paladin, The Legend of Sword and Fairy 7. But as you can see, it's been localized for us as Sword and Fairy Together Forever. After playing through it and seeing all that I could see, I really do think it's an easy recommendation for me to make, especially if you enjoyed their other game. I mean, it's beautiful to look at, it's well animated, and the story is actually far more interesting than I thought it would be. Not to mention that the underlying systems and mechanics are well implemented and the combat is really fun to engage with. I think this game is going to pass by a lot of players and that would be a shame. I personally found it to be really enjoyable and I think it deserves to be seen and played by a lot of people. So, as usual, let's first talk about what the game actually is and the details of it. Sword and Fairy Together Forever is an action-adventure RPG that features a story inspired by Chinese mythology and a visual design based on traditional Chinese aesthetics. You play as a young girl named Yue King Xu. She's the eldest disciple of the Ming Xu sect and she's proficient in the art of spirit servants. Spirit servants are spirits who enter into a kind of mystical contract with their master and take the form of cute or perhaps chibi-style animals. The spirits can often transform into much larger and more powerful versions of themselves when needed and have various magical abilities. You actually start the game as a different character entirely, a deity named Xiu Wu who is sent to destroy a rogue deity but fails his mission and accidentally ends up in the human realm. Xiu Wu wields a sword known as the Chun Zi which can tear holes in reality and allow him to travel across the six realms. This sword very quickly becomes quite relevant to the plot but as usual I really don't want to spoil anything so I think I'll leave it there for now. Once you finish the linear prologue section you'll gain control of Yue King Shu and that's where the game properly opens up. In terms of gameplay, I suppose we have three sections to discuss. You've got the exploration, the combat, and the RPG mechanics. The game handles exploration by giving the player a semi-open world with medium-sized zoned-off areas. These areas contain story quests, side quests, materials, healing items, enemies to fight, and a few minor puzzles as well. As you might expect, the story quests will lead you through the game and have you traveling to all sorts of different locations as the narrative progresses. However, you can travel back to previous areas in order to pick up side quests from the NPCs, which can be completed for materials and XP rewards. It is worth noting that travel can sometimes be locked off to certain areas due to certain story elements. The combat in Sword and Fairy consists of weapon-based attacks mixed with some powerful magical abilities. You can perform light attacks and heavy attacks with your sword as well as putting them together in a combo much in the same way that Musou or Warriors games do. You could hit three light attacks and end the combo with a heavy attack for example and that will result in a sort of combo finisher move which hits quite hard. You can also jump to get to higher ground, lock onto enemies, and of course dodge incoming attacks. If you hold down the right trigger, you'll get access to your unlock spells, and you simply press the corresponding face button to activate it. Spells are on a cooldown and they do cost MP to use, but you can recover your MP by attacking the enemies with your sword. Defeating the various enemies in the game will reward you with XP, money, and materials which can be used for crafting, smithing, and cooking amongst other things. Lastly, as far as gameplay goes, we come to the RPG mechanics, and there is quite a few of them. I won't go into every minute little detail, especially because some things are unlocked via the story, but this should give you a good idea of what to expect. As you explore the world, you'll be obtaining a lot of different materials. These materials can be used as a simple healing item or used in cooking to create buffs for your characters. You can also use materials like stone and a metal known as ferrochrome to improve your weapons at a blacksmith. Weapons can only be upgraded a certain amount of times and you can choose which bonuses you get, something like extra attack power or critical damage for example. It's worth pointing out that while this does feature equipable gear, it's not really a loot-driven title. It's presented as a much more spectacle fighter type of progression where your upgrades are tied or limited to story progression and discovering secrets. Just to give you an idea of what I mean, during my playthrough I found a few pieces of clothing for the main character that seem to be completely missable, so it is worth exploring every little place that you find. The different items of clothing do grant stat bonuses like extra defense, so it is probably a good idea to seek them out if you can. 
leveling up is handled in a somewhat understated way. Normally in most RPGs when you level up it flashes up on the screen and lets you know that you've done it and gives you a skill point or something like that. In this game though I did some farming in one of the open areas and at the end of it I'd actually leveled up twice and didn't realise that I'd done it. It does happen of course but the game doesn't really make a fuss about it. Your stats do increase and more skills do become available, it just isn't obvious when it all happens. A little way into the game you'll unlock the spirit system and this is essentially your main character menu where you can organise your party, equip items, check stats, check quests, assign abilities, read about your characters and interact with your spirit servants. I'll also just point out that I'm not showing you the full party of characters here for obvious reasons. The spirit servant menu allows you to pet and feed your collected spirits and once again I'm only showing you the first one here. Over the course of your adventures you'll acquire different qualities of spirit fruit which you can then feed to your spirits to increase their level. When they level up they gain a gift point which is basically a skill point. You can then increase the skills that that spirit has which gives you, the player, passive bonuses. The spirits do appear in battles but they can't actually be damaged or hurt in any way. Equipping different spirits simply changes the buffs that you have active and can allow you to learn new abilities as well. And I think that about does it for the main parts of the game so let's quickly talk about performance, availability and a few other details. The first of which is that the game does include a photo mode for players and artists to make use of and I believe the console version of the game features some exclusive weapon skins and outfits. Performance wise I played on the PS5 and the game ran at a mostly solid 4K 60fps with only some minor dips here and there. I personally only experienced a couple of minor bugs and they were just based on visuals. You can see here that the main character isn't exactly situated properly and is kind of floating above the table. Other than that I had no problems with the game whatsoever although your experience may vary when playing the game on PS4 or PC. Speaking of which, the game is already available on PC and has been since October 2021 but as you've probably realised by now my review is just for the new console version. I have heard that the PC version has slightly more issues to do with optimization, so I would urge you to check out the reviews on Steam before getting it there. And just so you know it's currently sitting at a 71% mostly positive rating which includes over 10,000 reviews so that's something to consider. On consoles your options are PS4 or PS5 at the time of writing although it does look like the game's going to be download only for a little while. Originally all of the online stores had the standard physical edition of the game up for pre-order for the day of release but it seems like they've all been taken down. I did some digging and it looks like the physical copies won't be coming to the west until early 2023. Whenever this happens I really wish they could just delay the digital release until the physical copies are ready but it does seem like they've added two special editions to the lineup. Apparently there's now a premium edition and a collector's edition so I suppose that's something. It doesn't really make me feel any better about the staggered release but it is what it is and I can't change it. The PC version is available right now and the new digital console version releases on the 4th of August 2022 with the physical copies arriving early in 2023. So how do I feel about the game? Do I like it? Did I enjoy it? Would I recommend it? I think I'd have to say yes to all three honestly. I did quite enjoy the Sword 7 game last year and I made that pretty clear in my review of it. I'll actually link that below if anyone's interested in seeing it but yeah I like that one so when I first heard of Sword and Fairy I was quite eager to give it a try. As far as my experiences go this was a very solid port of the original PC release and the version that I played seems to work much better than the original version ever did. I've had the review copy of the game for you know quite a while now and it's had multiple patches throughout my time with it and I wouldn't be surprised if it gets another one on release day. They do seem to be working pretty hard on it, you know, making sure it's stable, making sure it works correctly and my experiences with it have been incredibly positive so overall I'm pretty happy with it. I think the first thing I really want to talk about is the visuals. I mean, my god this is a pretty game. The prologue section looks absolutely fine although it's just mostly rocks and caves but when you get out into the forest areas and the towns it's just a sight to behold. I definitely don't want to oversell it though, it's not perfect. It's still got this one issue in random areas where the textures look really low res and kind of stretched. This actually happened in the Sword 7 game as well and I noted it in that review. I did notice this section of rocks here that I'm showing you now at the start of the game but then you know you kind of look up and then you're just blown away by how beautiful everything else looks. The environments are probably the star of the show but the character models aren't bad either. I mean I kind of hate to admit it but I'm a little bit in love with the main character, <laughs> just saying. First of all I mean she's stunningly beautiful but she's also determined, powerful yet sweet and caring when she needs to be. Over the course of the game I actually became very fond of her and now I really wish I hadn't seen that statue of her online for over $300. 
I think the abilities that you use in combat look really good. They've got nice animations and some bright particle effects that really add a certain something to the magical attacks. The Spirit Servants are a fun little addition as well, and the fact that they give you buffs and also act as a sort of virtual pet that can basically digivolve when needed is pretty cool. When you look at the combat overall, I think it's better than good. I think it's great, but there is one small caveat to it. And that is, when you're swinging your sword or using skills, you really do need to lock onto the enemies to make it feel right. You may actually see it in some of the gameplay, but there's times where I start attacking towards a certain enemy, and the game doesn't really hit where it should. It kind of ignores your directional input a little bit if you don't lock on. Thing is though, once I got into the habit of simply locking on all of the time, it becomes far more pleasant to control. I'd say that the RPG side of things works pretty well. It hasn't got deep role-playing systems, but the ones it does have all work in sync to produce something that feels coherent and solid. Some RPGs can really overdo or undercook their systems, which can, at times, make the games feel very bland. I think this game sits in that sweet spot of having just enough supporting systems to make everything feel meaningful. One thing I will point out is that the game isn't actually that long. It's not exactly short, but it does clock in at around 25 hours for the main story and probably another 8 to 10 hours if you want 100% it. That's actually another good example of overdoing it. I feel like some games give me 200 hours of dull gameplay and story, while some give me an enjoyable, solid experience in 30 hours for the same price. Very much like Bright Memory Infinite, which I reviewed recently. A very short experience, but a strong, action-packed one for not that much money. I suppose in the end though, it all comes down to how much each player is willing to pay and for what kind of game. The story, the characters, the world, and the myths that inspired them are genuinely quite interesting to me, but as with most things, that comes down to the individual. I'm much more interested in Japanese culture myself, I can speak the language a little bit, and I'm planning my first trip to Tokyo in a few years, so that'll be pretty cool. Even with all that said, I have nothing at all against Chinese stories or game developers. I'm more than happy to give their stuff a try, unless it's a free-to-play mobile game, then I'm afraid we'd have some issues. Lastly, I just want to mention that the game does not feature an English dub, but does include Chinese voice acting with English subtitles. In my opinion, Sword and Fairy Together Forever is a very well-made RPG that I have no doubt will be ignored by the majority of players. As far as I'm concerned, it has a compelling story, brilliant visuals, fun combat, solid RPG mechanics, and an adorable protagonist to round it all out. If you enjoy action RPGs, I really don't see how you could skip this one. Ultimately, I'm not going to go ahead and call this a perfect 10 out of 10 masterpiece, but it is, in my view, a very good game. I mean, is it going to rival something like God of War Ragnarok? Of course not, but at the same time, it doesn't have to. This is just a good quality RPG that deserves your attention when you have the time available. I know that quite a few people picked up the other Sword 7 game after seeing my review and told me how surprised they were by its quality. In this case, I think Sword and Fairy is even better than that was, and therefore, I absolutely recommend it to you. If you enjoy the video, I really hope you'll consider subscribing, and if you like what I do and want to help support the channel, please check out the first link in the video description down below. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.